أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Dear Muslim brothers and respected guests from the non-Muslims who are seeking to understand the purpose of life. My speech to you concerning the purpose of life, as I always mention, is simply a means of communication. However, it's a very powerful, critical, vital subject. And before I enter the main point of the the topic, let me first ask you a question that may stimulate your minds. Now many of you are, and most of you, are educated, well endowed, leaders in your own fields, fathers, mothers, professionals, sophisticated human beings. But did you ever ask yourself the question or a set of questions? Do you know why you are here on this earth? And when you die, and of course, there's nobody that has any doubt, regardless of what persuasion, what denomination, what gender, what background, what church, what religion, system, ideology, or ism that you belong to, there's no doubt that everybody in this room one day will die. Now, if there's anyone that has a doubt about that, then you're the only one that doesn't have to answer the question, what is the purpose of life? Because you may be able to circumvent the consequences or the responsibility of that question. Of course, No one has any doubt about death, for if the benefactor of life, the causer of life, the creator of life, the owner of life, if that source of life had no other power over the creatures that have life, death would be enough evidence. Where is your destination? I don't mean where are you leaving from here. But where is your destination? You don't know where you came from. You say you were born. I mean before that. Where is your destination? Think about this question and ponder it seriously as we continue this presentation. Now, in the world that we live in, there are many beliefs, many religions, many philosophies that have been offered to satisfy or respond to this question because human beings are the only creatures on the earth or in the heavens. Of course, we're speaking about based on scientific fact. We're not talking about Metro Goldwyn Mayer or Steven Spielberg or Disneyland. They have some other philosophies that they will give us the indication to believe. But until now, there is no scientific evidence 
that there are any other creatures in the heavens or the earth who has the intellect or the faculties or the capacity of human beings. And because of the faculties that human beings are endowed with, they have the exclusive ability, the freedom to think and feel and to say I, me, and to express what we call ego. No other creatures have this ability. However, we know that, that even that ability is limited because when the human being is a child, there is less ego. And as the human being becomes older, there is even less ego. The height of the human being's ego is at the height of their strength, their development their endowment, what they have, what they call strength, possession. But it lasts only an afternoon. That afternoon might be in some cases 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 60 years, 80 years. But inevitably, the years of the human being passes quickly. And as the Quran says, وَخَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَكْوِيمٍ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ And we created, God says, He created by His own power the human being and gave him or her the faculties, perfect, balanced, complete faculties of intellect, intelligence, seeing, Hearing, feeling, taste, touch, thinking, and the apparatus of the body. We gave the human being a complete set of faculties that is created that human being with a mold. But after that, after giving them, endowing that human being with that, perfect set of faculties, then we return him or her to the lowest of the low. They lose the eyesight, they lose the hearing, they lose the smell, they lose the touch, they lose the taste, they lose and depreciate even the physical composition. Now this is what the Quran said 15, almost 1500 years ago. Is this the case? It is. It is only human beings that have the ability to think, feel, imagine, and explore. To propose and to determine. These human beings have over their period of recorded history developed and put forward many different concepts and answers and many writers, poets, sages, philosophers, Prophets and messengers, peace be upon all of those prophets and messengers, have come to tell us, you and I, what is the purpose of life. Now to be literary, we need to define life as it applies to the universe. And we don't mean to define life universally, because we cannot. It's too wide of a subject. It's too far, and we haven't explored that much. The time that man has been on this earth, man has come to discover a few things. But relative to the size of the universe, man hasn't covered even a pin drop. But man has discovered a few things about himself, his environment, and the world. So let us define life as it applies to the human being 
his society, and his environment. And then let us consider the purpose of our existence in this respect. Generally, we find in the dictionaries the following definition of human life. One, the phenomena of existence. The phenomena, this means something which is unsolved, unknown, profound, and scientific facts yet have to be able to explain it. Phenomena. Another word for phenomena is called miracle. The phenomena of existence as it applies to one, biological development. Two, social dynamics. Three, psychological and mental processes. Four, the interdependence and interaction with the external environment, and finally, the complete synchronization of the many micro and macro systems that support human existence and the universe as we know it. Isn't that a profound definition? Next, let us define the word purpose, because we said life, now let's define purpose. Purpose means objective, aim, significance, Meaning, target, mission, reality. That's purpose. With these general definitions, let us surf the web. Let us approach our topic, the purpose of life. Now, in our discussion, the purpose of life, let's keep it all in context. What do we want to do? We want to know that as human beings, what is our objective in respect to why are we here and where are we going? And who is our benefactor? Who or what is our common benefactor that is responsible for us being here? Because when we define that, then we know who we are accountable to. It's very simple. Those of you who work on a job and you're not the boss, you understand the issue of subordination. And those of you who work on jobs and you are the bosses, you also understand accountability and you exercise it. Now some facts that we need to think about and talk about, the creation of the world. Is the creation of this world, in all of its complex forms, is it the result of the thinking of human beings? I ask you, yes or no? Yes or no? I just want to make sure we're in consensus here. Another fact, man is the most sophisticated creature in the known and explored universe. Now we heard about E.T. <laughs> but there's no evidence, no scientific evidence with all the theories and sightings of extraterrestrial beings and sophisticated civilizations outside of this universe that Star Trek has come in contact with. It hasn't been documented. Until now, man is the most sophisticated creature in the known and explored universe, therefore, if he's the most sophisticated, just like the boss on the job, he is the most what? Responsible. That there are inherent laws, both physical and metaphysical, that govern the universe and also govern man. And to make sure that we're not getting too abstract, Law is as simple as what you witness 
if you go to the top of a building, male or female, rich or poor, of any color, you go to the top of a building and lean over, you are witnessing the phenomena of law. It comes in the form of fear and apprehension, but it's the law of falling because you will not be able to deny gravity. And if you cannot deny gravity, you also know that falling from a distance will cause you some harm, trauma. That's a law that's inherent. Another simple law is that if you are a functional human being and you eat and drink, you will also from time to time have to use the toilet. All human beings, no matter who they are, how smart they are, keep this in mind, no matter how arrogant they are, what kind of clothes they wear, what kind of talk they talk, what kind of weapons they have, they're all just human beings. When you know that, you can still deal with them and keep everything in context because some of them would lead you to think that they're different. Everyone and everything in this life will inevitably be subjected to erosion, depreciation, annihilation, and death. Everything. And as we sit here, everyone here is getting older. Another day towards death. You can call it older, but it's a little closer towards death. And even as we say here, it's already there. We say now, it's already then. So even the present is something that eludes us. We only know the present by virtue of how the sun moves. Minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. And we wouldn't know that if we didn't watch the calendar or the clock. It's called time. We also know that the earth is equipped with a perfectly balanced environment for the existence of human life. And that until now, with all of man's instrumentalization, with all of man's sophistication, with all of his exploration, man has yet to find another planet or star within his reach that has an environment suitable for human life. Isn't that ironic? The Earth is what planet from the Sun? The third planet, isn't it? If it were the fourth planet, it would be too cold for human life, wouldn't it? Would not harness, service human life. If it was the second planet, it would burn up. Human beings could not live. They would suffocate from the heat. But the Earth's atmosphere is maintained and balanced perfectly from where it is. If it was just five miles closer to the sun or five miles away from the sun, it would fall out of its orbit and we would all die or disintegrate. Who keeps the Earth in that perfect balance and orbit? And who put that Earth there? And who put the ecosystem around the Earth so that everything on the Earth would complement it and also serve human beings. Who did that? The intelligence of human beings is specially designed and endowed for administration, accountability, organization, development of technology and industry. So it's no accident that human beings build things that human beings are able to figure out things from the time that they rub sticks together and find and was able to build a fire from the time they were able to find out they could float on the water or fly in the air or produce their basic needs such as growing things from the beginning man learned that he had the intellect to implement improvise create design. But one of the unique things that man should always keep in mind, whatever he's able to invent, design, engineer, improvise, 
create, it's always from something, isn't it? Always from something. Can man create anything, design anything, maintain anything, engineer anything from nothing, with no materials? No, he cannot. Throughout the recorded history of humanity, there have been outstanding personalities for the last at least 5,000 years. That is, 2,000 years since Jesus Christ and 3,000 years before Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. For 5,000 recorded years, there have been human beings came calling themselves prophets, messengers. Most of you and most of all human beings, whether from China or from Africa, or from Europe, or from Asia, or from America, North or South America, or anywhere in the, in the world, they know the names of these human beings because they were outstanding human beings, extraordinary human beings. At their time, because of their behavior and their impact upon society, men like Noah, Abraham, Moses, Men like Solomon, David, Jacob, Isaac, Zachariah, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, and Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Peace and blessings be upon all of them. These extraordinary human beings over the period of 5,000 years stand out from all of the human beings. Now, they were not industrialists. They were not professors of universities. They were not sophisticated in terms of their academia. But it was the commitment to human behavior and their insistence upon worshiping only God. Their common message was this whole phenomena, man in his, his environment, man and his challenge and his drama, man, the life that's given to him, man and his responsibility, man is the beneficiary of whom? God. All those prophets said that. Now it doesn't matter which one of those prophets that you prefer above the other, it doesn't matter. They all said the same thing. They came at different times, different places to different people, but they all said the same thing. Man, think about your life and what gift has been given to you it is God that gave it to you and you are responsible to acknowledge the one that gave you this gift this is what these prophets and messengers said recognize conform and worship God Almighty God without any partners diversities associates without any idols, without any pagan practices, for God wants you to recognize him, worship him, and conform and obey directly. Directly. Through education, worship, and the acceptance of global moralities, Human beings are able to establish civilized behavior. Now, this is a very important point. Global morality. Now, one of the, global, the globally accepted moralities is that one should not take the life of another without justification. Isn't that a global morality? One should not take the property of another. One should not covet the wife, husband of another. One should not slander. One should not undermine. One should not do these things. These are called global behaviors. One should act decently towards their fellow man. These are called global behaviors. For if you go to China, if you go to Africa, here in Australia, if you go to Europe, if you go to Russia, you go to anywhere, there are what they call globally accepted codes of conduct. 
no matter what religion they are, or no religion at all, they still observe these globally established codes of conduct. We call them good and bad. Because if that were not the case, there would be no way to establish what is good, and there would be no way to establish what is bad, and people who thought whatever they thought was good would have their people, and the people who thought whatever was good on another side would have their people, and there would be wars just based upon the perception of good. Wars are not based upon the perception of good. Wars are based upon the perception of personal interest. But good and bad is well established. Male and female used to be clear. <laughs> Sky and earth is clear. Water and ice are clear. Salt and pepper are clear. There are some very clearly established radicals, differences that even animals recognize. But humans, when their faculties become clouded or distorted, they are the only creatures that forget these radicals. Because things that animals don't do, humans, when their sense of morality becomes distorted, they do what animals don't do. I want you to consider the complex organization of this universe and think to yourself, could man or a group of men had anything to do with it? I think you answered before, absolutely not. I want you to consider the phenomenal diversity of the Earth's systems and its environment. Think for a moment. Think about the mountains, some which have never been climbed. Think about the oceans that man has been able to build machines to cover, deserts that man has been able to build machines to cover, but still, they exist. Think about the ecosystem, the atmosphere, the stratosphere, the ionosphere. Think about the atmosphere of just our universe, which is a small universe within the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is a very small galaxy in the Andromeda. And the Andromeda is only one of millions or billions clusters. Think about that. How then significant is man? How significant is the human being when we think about this vastness? Think about the recently discovered characteristics of the microsystems existing within substance itself. That is, it has been discovered recently that the atom is not the smallest part of substance. Now there are what? Microatoms, isn't it? There's something now called the quarks. They say which is a millionth of an atom, a split of a millionth of an atom. And now we have discovered that every part of creation that has been discovered is inside of a drop of water. Well, the Quran already said that to us 1,500 years ago, that we created everything and every single thing from water. The Quran said that. Think about the anatomy of the human being and the intricate and complicated systems that are necessary for its functioning. That you and I, we can only go maybe 28 days without water, and then we die. That you and I, if we are put in a room, and we are fed and giving water and everything of support, but no one to talk to, we will go crazy and we will die. Because we're social beings, and without somebody to communicate with, we will go crazy and die from depression. Think about the anatomy of the human body and its complicated systems that are necessary for its functioning. Think about the kidneys. Think about the brain. Think about the tongue. How is it that a person catches a stroke and when they catch a stroke, they lose the ability to taste? How much would they pay? 
How much would they pay just to be able to taste an apple? Think about the stomach and when a person catches cancer of some sort and is unable to digest their food and has a bag outside of their body, what would they pay to have that repaired? Think about the lungs. Think about the skin, how it functions, how it breathes, how it intakes. Think about the fingers. Think about the 360 joints of the body, how they function. Just think about all the different functions and phenomena of the human body that man is still discovering and if he has to investigate, research and discover, certainly he did not create himself. Isn't it clear? Think about the discoveries of forensic science, genetic research, laser technology, quantum physics, atomic and nuclear energy, fiber optics, global telecommunications and medical research and still man lives like an animal. Man has not come up with a formula to be able to deal harmoniously with other human beings and to resolve differences without slaughtering the rest of his human beings. Man still hasn't come up with that ability. Think about the many food substances and the aquamarine substances that make up the common air that we breathe every second and minute of our lives and the many sources of fundamental energy that human civilization depends upon. Think about the many different types of energy that the human being needs just to live. Tell me, how is all of this possible without a power and an intelligence outside of the universe and the human phenomena. At this point, I'd like my brother to recite a few verses from the Quran. And I just want you to be patient because when we give a proof from the Quran, we want you to hear the medicine. Now you won't know what he's saying right away because it's in Arabic. But out of respect for the revelation, I want him to recite it. Then I'm going to translate it for you because it's relative to my topic. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وآية لهم الأرض الميتة أحييناها وأخرجنا منها حبا وأخرجنا منها حبا فمنه يأكلون وجعلنا فيها جنات من نخيل وأعناب وفجرنا فيها من العيون ليأكلوا من ثمره وما عملته أيديهم أفلا يشكرون سبحان الذي خلق الأزواج كلها مما تنبت الأرض مما تنبت الأرض ومن أنفسهم ومما لا يعلمون وآية لهم الليل نسلخ منه النهار فإذا هم مظلمون والشمس تجري لمستقر لها ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم والقمر قدرناه منازل حتى عاد كالعرجون القديم لا الشمس ينبغي لها القمر ولا الليل سابق النهار وكل في فلك يسبحون. I want to remind you or tell you that this revelation, the Quran, was revealed 1424 years ago to an illiterate. That means 
a man who had no schooling, a man born in the desert, an Arab, chosen by Almighty God to receive a revelation, a man like Jesus, a man like John the Baptist, a man like Zachariah, a man like Isaac, a man like Ismail, a man like Moses, a man like Abraham, a man like Noah, a man like Adam, alayhi salam, peace and blessing be upon him, a man, a messenger, and a prophet. Now this Quran that he recited is recited by 1.4 billion people in the world and memorized from cover to cover 6,626 verses by literally millions of Muslims. Not a few, but millions. And it is the ambition of every Muslim to have a son or a daughter in their life that memorizes this entire book. So it's not a phenomenon except that this book was memorized and preserved in the life of the one that it received it from God. And in his lifetime, it was memorized and it was retained and never changed and intact until now. Look what it says. I gave you some statistics and the basis of it was from the Quran. The Quran says, and a sign for them is the dead earth. It is brought back to life and then from it springs fruits and grains of all kinds which they eat. And we place therein gardens and palm trees and grapevines and cause them to burst forth therein some springs that come from the ground that man doesn't control himself and there he creates his industry. That they may eat of the fruit created by God and their hands have not produced it at all. So will they be grateful? Exalted is he who created all life in pairs. So the Quran establishes that everything in life, everything in life has been created in pairs. Were the plants, were the animals, were the insects, were the fish, or bacteria. Has science ratified that, that everything in life has been created in pairs? Yes. The Quran said that 1,424 years ago. And of course, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he wasn't a botanist. He wasn't a geologist. He didn't have a microscope. He had no way of knowing that. The only way a human being 1,424 years could know that is through the help and inspiration of the one who is the creator from the beginning. Because that fact that everything has been created in pairs was only discovered 78 years ago, scientifically. Exalted is he, almighty God, who created all things in pairs from what the earth grows and from themselves, the human beings, and from that which they do not know. That means here the Quran is establishing that there are some creatures, maybe micro creatures, that are also created in pairs that the human being doesn't know about. And a sign for them is the night that we extract from the light of the day. Now this is the phenomena itself that we have now discovered from going out of space. When we go out in space, we realize that the night, we realize that the day is extracted from the night, not the night from the day. We realize that night is first and day is second, although we say day night. We realize now that time is really inverted, but you have to go out in space to be able to see it. That's why in Australia, we are sitting here at 9.30 in the evening, isn't it? 
In London, it is now 10.30 in the morning, but yesterday. And in America, it's 5.30 in the morning yesterday. But we just discovered that dimension of time recently, didn't we? We didn't know that before. But the Quran establishes that. Because listen to this. And the sun runs its own course towards its stopping point. And that is the determination of the exalted in might, the knowing. And the moon, we have determined for it, phases until it returns, appearing like a date stalk. Now think about it. Here the Quran has established that the sun runs its course along with its other bodies, which carries it. What bodies does the sun carry with it? It's nine planets, is that correct? Based upon the movement of the sun and the planets around it, we establish what? Time, isn't it? And based upon the movement of the moon around the earth, we establish what? Another set of time. Now how did the Quran establish this 1,424 years ago? While the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he didn't have any telescope. He didn't know that. He could only have known that through the aid and the assistance of revelation or inspiration from the one who created. The Quran says it is not allowed. Listen to this. La shamsu yambaghi laha an tudrika al-qamar wa la al-layl sabiqu al-nahar wa fi falaq yasbahun wa kullun fi falaq yasbahun it is not allowed for the sun to reach the moon that is to outstrip it nor is it allowed for the night to overtake the day, but each one of them swims along in its own law and orbit. When was that established? How long was it that Copernicus gave us a theory that man was in the center of the universe? Did you remember that? That man was the center of the universe. We know now that man is not the center of the universe at all. Well, 1,424 years ago, the Quran established that the sun cannot outstrip the moon and the night cannot outstrip the day, but each one of them are engaged in a predetermined law and orbit. This is the Quran. Dear brothers and sisters, all of this is to establish in your minds, all of this dialogue, all of this evidence, all of this proof is to clearly establish in everybody's mind here that you and I nor all of us together, nor all the human beings in other places throughout the earth, none of us individually, endowed or unendowed, intelligent or unintelligent, educated or otherwise, rich or poor, black or white, male or female, none of us are benefactors. Who's the benefactor? Who's the benefactor? God. The Almighty. The Creator. Your Lord, my Lord. This was established by those prophets and messengers, those extraordinary human beings that I spoke about a few moments ago. That was already established. I didn't need to come here and establish that. I just need to come here and remind you of that. Now those extraordinary human beings were the ones that came to tell other human beings who thought at that time that they were somewhat sophisticated. Isn't that, you know, this is unique about humans. At every age, even 5,000 years ago, they thought they were modern. At every age, human beings, no matter what stage of development they are at, they think that they are modern and more sophisticated than others. This is the nature of human beings. Yet all of them don't seem to ponder on the fact that they're only here for a moment. And some of them, during the moment that they're here, they become so arrogant. They begin to say that we, we, we are the owners. We are the peacekeepers. 
We are the organizers. We are the administrators. We are the ones who created ourselves, determined for ourselves, legislate for ourselves and others, and we own everything and we determine everything. Isn't there some people that say that? You're either with us <laughs> or against us. And don't give man, don't give man a few tools that he can use, a few things that he can throw or some missiles that he can shoot. He really becomes arrogant then. <laughs> well, you know, when Moses, when he went to Pharaoh, Abraham, when he went to Pharaoh, Peace and blessing be upon him. When Abraham went to Pharaoh and talked to Pharaoh, Pharaoh told Abraham, why should I worship your God? Why? I have command over life and death. Anybody I want to die will die. Anybody I want to live will live. What did Abraham say to Pharaoh? What did he say to him? If you really got some power, the one, you, the one that, that you kill, bring him back to life. The one you kill, bring him back to life if you got power. And if you got some power, when the sun sets in the west, you cause it to rise and make it set in the east. Was Pharaoh able to do that? He wasn't able to do that then, and the Pharaohs today can't do it today. Because throughout the span of man's interaction with man, there has always been the confrontation between the arrogant, the worldly, the boastful, those who feel that they are the owners, the administrators, the materialists. There's always been that confrontation between the materialists and the faithful, the prophets of God whom I mentioned some of their names, they were always the godly, the faithful. The people having faith and belief, knowing that this world and all its tangible resources are the result of whose command? God. Those people who are godless, mindless, heedless, arrogant, rebellious, wanting to own everything, wanting to expand from their place throughout the world and even control everything in the world and even want to control outer space. And look how, look how God sends signs and that man doesn't seem to want to heed it. Did you know that the space exploration project that the USSR, or they don't call it that anymore, it's called now the Soviet Union, or the Soviet states, they got it now. They changed the name, didn't they? Changed the currency. I think they're even bed, they're in bed with the capitalists now, aren't they? Anyway, the, the Russian, or they call themselves Russians now, right. So the, the Russian uh, American space exploration project that has now expanded itself to include uh, the state of Israel. Well, that's wonderful. That's a nice addition. Well, they were, had a very ambitious space exploration project that included building, what do they call that, that you look up in the sky and see it at night? Yeah, the space station. So they were building a space station so that they would be able to establish in the heavens a place to prove to us that there is no God up here. And that they would build a new frontier, that was Star Trek and his people's called it. <laughs> and through their robotronics, they would create a new race of slaves that would serve them from outer space, spy on those on the earth, and control the whole heavens and the earth. They led us to believe that. Well, after this last failure, this recent failure, 
that they don't speak about anymore, this tragedy, this $56 million project, $56 billion project. Now keep this in mind, $56 billion of your tax dollars and mine, it's frozen, paralyzed, the whole project. And you've got people up there at that space station that will die because they got to have regular flights back and forth just to support them and they don't have any flights right now and they don't expect to have any more for at least 10 months. So God has shown them just through one sign that's not where man belongs. That's not the environment where man is supposed to live, multiply, develop, or control. And let me tell you another little aspect of that space station project. They were developing a theory that they could take people that are in prisons or people that they consider to be dysfunctional or without any real use and they could transport them to the space station and just put them in orbit. <laughs> that was the plan, that 12 years from now they would transfer major prison populations up there and create prison colonies where they would produce things there but they would be in orbit so they wouldn't have to worry about them escaping. Man, man is something, isn't it? <laughs> now, those prophets and messengers, they had their task. And what was their task? Their task was coming to these kinds of people then and also now. The godly people today have the same task to come to those people now and say to them that, don't you know that God is the benefactor of the heavens and the earth and everything that is in it. Don't you know that? Now, how do we know that there's a God? And how do we know that there's a creator that whom should be worshipped? Well, let me give you a proverb. And out of man came to the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessing be upon him, and asked him a similar question. And out of a Bedouin, because these were simple people. He came to the Prophet him with a question. How do we know that there's a God? Or how do we know that there's a cr creator whom should be worshipped? Let me tell you what the Prophet, that illiterate Prophet, that unlettered Prophet, that simple man, that messenger and Prophet of God, let me tell you what he said. He said, the presence of dung is the evidence that a camel was here. The presence of dung is the evidence that a camel was here. The footprints in the sand is the evidence that a person was here. And the evidence of the earth and all the planets are proof that the same one or some great power has placed them where they are. That's what the prophet said. His proof was good enough for that Arab and is good enough for me. Why should we not consider the theories of natural selection or the Big Bang or the concept of perpetual evolution as plausible evidence for the existence of the world or creation or universe? Because none of these theories can deny the fact that macro and micro systems are arranged, fixed, proportioned, measured, determined, limited, synchronized, and given distinct characteristics and parameters that they cannot go beyond or exceed. Secondly, the fact that they have such predictable and recognizable characteristics allow for man to study, reflect, perform research that enables him, that is man, to reach scientific conclusions and apply certain technological instruments that provide benefit or substantiation to the evolution of his social environment. That's the facts. That's why that these plausible, these concepts of evolution, natural selection, or predetermined evolution are not plausible. 
The other consideration is that whatever position that you want to arrive at, you or I, concerning a divine creator and almighty God, one thing is for certain. We cannot deny that all of us exist. Do we exist? If you agree with me that we all exist, that we're all here, I mean, I think everybody believes that we're all here. We're all here. And we are being, that we are subsisting and being sustained through a unique balance of environmental phenomena that we are not the authors of, then someone, some great power, is, has to be, must be the author and responsible for all of this. Now those prophets and messengers, all of them, profound men, they all said to their people that there is no God except Almighty God. That means there's nothing to be worshipped, nothing to be obeyed, nothing to be adored, nothing to be bowed down to, nothing to subordinate to except the Almighty. That's what they said. And they said that that Lord and Creator not only has designed the heavens and the earth, not only has put laws in the earth, but has also created a legislation, a morality, and a system for the human beings to live. Because would you think that as a parent, that you work as hard as you do, pursue your own education and your own career, and build a house or buy a house, and have a family, and then you have children, and you don't create an environment, or you don't set down any ethics or any code of behavior for your children, don't you? I mean, even though some children think that it should be otherwise, I think most people, most parents feel that they have a right to establish law, principle, ethics, and behavior inside their home, don't you? Well, do you think that you have more right to establish law and ethics and behavior and a system of what comes and goes in your own home, but that the creator of the heavens and the earth and the environment that you live in, this vast universe that you see and witness and depend upon, that the creator or the benefactor of that would not do the same? Those prophets and messengers said that the Almighty has given to man a system to submit, to surrender, a system by which to recognize God, a system by which to conform to God, a system by which to worship God, and we call that system religion, but that's not a comprehensive word. When we say religion, we think that's something we do on Sunday or Friday or Saturday or sometimes. When we say religion, we think that's something that we do only for God when we get afraid or we get broke or when we get drunk the next day. Oh my God. <laughs> See, when you say religion, it has a limited preconditioning type of word. But when you say system, now everybody can relate to systems now. If it's only financial system, you can relate to that. System means comprehensive. System means an apparatus, something that functions, that everybody depends upon, something that needs to be maintained, something that is set, something that has a criteria, something that is predictable, something that everybody can look at and function and be a part of. That's a system. Well, all the systems that man, what his mind has made, don't you think that the creator would have a system better than that? Man has made a camera. Look at the eye. Man has made a computer. Look at the brain. Man has made nuclear plants. Look at the heart. Man has created apparatuses to do different chemical analyses. Look at the kidneys. Man has created all kinds of instruments to remember to detect, to do forensics. Look how the human body functions. 
And so does man think that he can keep records on other men and on the world and maintain history, historical records? Does man think that he can do all of that, but the one that created him can't keep tracks on him? Does man think that he can be accountable or that others are accountable to him, that he can govern you men, government, that he can govern you men, that he can create government, but that the creator who has made the heavens and the earth does not have the ability to hold us accountable? The prophets and the messengers of Almighty God said to those at that time, to their people, that the system in front of the Creator starts with submission. Submission means peace. And peace is a part of prosperity. How can a human being have peace with another human being? How can a peace process move forward? How we can find a, a solution, a peaceful solution? How can nations have peace together when they are at war with God? Being at war with God is like being at war with your own conscience. Being at war with God is like denying your father and mother. Being at war with God is like denying yourself, telling yourself that you are not who you are. Islam, as a system of faith, is that system that is the natural progression of all the prophets and all their messages and all their behaviors that culminated in the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that culminated in this Quran, that culminated in the system which is called Islam. It is a system of morality. It is a system of consciousness. It is a system of discipline. It is a system recognizing laws that regulate human conduct. Islam is a system of social balance. Islam is a system of integration. Islam is a system that creates balance between the individual and the society. That means balance between individual interests and the interests of the society. Because to have peace and harmony in a society, there has got to be what? A balance between individual interests and social interests. Islam is a religion of peace. Islam is a religion of pure monotheism because if we were each of us to worship a God of our own, let's call the God of our own if you want to, call that God of your own yourself. So everybody picks out a God of their own. Therefore, each of us would have our own law, our own sense of right and wrong. How could we possibly agree? It could never happen. But if all of us acknowledge that there's one benefactor and one God, one creator, even if some of us were bad and some of us were good, but we all established that there's one creator, we would still have a way to reach what we call arbitration and adjudication, isn't it? There would still be some law. Islam is a system of social equality. That is... There's no inequality between male and female in Islam. Men are men and women are women. Women are not the same as men. They are the same in the sight of God. They have the same sanctity. They have the same rights in the sight of God. But men and women are not the same. They are similar, but they're not the same. Their anatomy is different, even if they want to exchange parts. <laughs> Still, it provides a psychological problem. When you find a male or female that has had a sex change, they also need a psychological change. <laughs> it doesn't work. Male and female are similar. Human beings from the same soul, from the same soul they were created, but they're not the same. They have a different psychology, they have a different anatomy, and they have a different destiny and function in the society. A balanced, natural, normal, healthy family society will admit that and apply that. Although the Supreme Court of the United States 
and the, and the House of Lords, the House of Commons, whatever they call them in Great Britain, and I don't know uh, what do you call it here, but in the Western civilizations now, they accept that somehow or another a healthy family can be two women that marry, two men that marry, and adopt children. They call it a, a nuclear family. What does that sound like? Islam says that's unacceptable to God. Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, all the prophets of God who came from God with a pure message, they said that that is wrong, that is ungodly, that is immoral. Now, I believe them. I don't believe the human beings that ignore them. And the result of those that don't heed the message of those prophets is disease, deformancy, imbalance, dysfunction, disparagement, inevitably despair, suicide. That's what happens to those kinds of people. Check their lives out in the long run. It doesn't work. Islam is a system that encourages and promotes knowledge and science. Islam is a system that strikes the balance between individualism and socialism. Islam eliminates religious excess and ritualistic innovation. Islam is a religion which is against religious intolerance and extremism. We cannot say that a person is, we can say a Muslim is, we can say a person is a Muslim extremist, a Christian extremist, a Muslim criminal, a Jewish criminal, a Christian criminal, we can say that. But we cannot say that Islam is an extremist religion because Islam by definition means a law that Almighty God has established for equity between the human beings, which is surrender and submission to his will. And God is not an extremist. And we cannot indict Jesus Christ for what Jim Jones did. We cannot indict Jesus Christ for what Charles Manson did. And he said he was the coming back of Christ. We cannot indict Jesus Christ for what Hitler did. We cannot indict Jesus Christ for what Timothy McVeigh did. Then how can we indict Islam for what perhaps some Muslims do? It's only fair. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. You heard that before. What's good for you has to be good for me. To be equitable, you can't say one thing for Muslims and another thing for Christians. That's not fair. I haven't heard any headlines, although all of the murder, as a matter of fact, I was wondering why 56 Catholic priests, cardinals, bishops, that are very close, I mean exceptionally close, to the Pope. 56 who are convicted pedophiles and have been pedophiles, convicted over a protracted period of time, none of them were called Christian criminals. Yet they were, they were endowed and entrusted with the lives of young children whom they corrupted over a protracted period of time. It wasn't like a few weeks. I mean like 30, 40 years. That's like the fox being in the ch chicken house for 40 years. <laughs> and it's not even really being in the chicken house. It's being in the chickadee house. Because they were not even chickens yet. But not one headline said Christian criminals. As a matter of fact, they doctored it up as if they needed some kind of psychological help. It was a little mistake, and uh, we just need to uh, work this thing out a little bit. And uh... Now, this is not an indictment against Christianity. This is not an indictment against the Vatican. Those were just some people who were entrusted with religious sanctity. 
But it's the nature of human beings to fall into traps like that when they fool themselves about something called celibacy. It don't even exist. Don't even try to be celibate. Don't even try to tell me that. There's something you're doing to balance it out. <laughs> now, Islam is a real religion. Islam says no celibacy. Whether you want to be a, a, a Muslim minister or you want to be a woman that is want to give herself to God, you still need a husband if you want to make a family. That's what Islam says because Islam is a religion of clear, moral, social, balance, and rationale. Islam is a religion of pure and wholesome moral principles. Yes, in Islam, alcohol, drugs, fornication, adultery, gambling, illicit sex, sodomy, child molestation, pornography, all of this is considered to be immoral and unlawful. Straightforward, Islam says. We don't dilly-dally about it. We don't have to do no voting about it. It's not a matter of individuality. 567 million abortions in Islam is considered to be murder. That's what we call it. That's what the Quran calls it. A life that you do not own, you do not have a right to take because you made a mistake. If you wanted to have free sex, you should know when you get pregnant that it's not free. <laughs> Islam is a religion of research, development, and progress. Islam is a religion of high culture and the development of human civilization. What do we want as Muslims? We want to invite people towards respecting themselves, building a high relationship with Almighty God through the behavior of the prophets of God, through following the law of God, and building a fraternity of godly people, whether they be black or white or yellow or red from the east or the west or male or female, whether they are rich or poor, a global fraternity of godly people who will do what? Use the book of God and the example of God's prophet to resolve their problems wheresoever they are. And yes, if you live in America, in the South, if you like to eat fried chicken, that's okay. You can keep that culture. We don't have to all eat the same food. We don't all have to dress in the same clothes. We don't all have to speak the same language. We all, as human beings, just need to do what? Use the law of God and the example of his prophets and our worship and our godliness to establish relationships between each other. This is the proposition of Islam. The proposition of Islam is the first, acknowledge God. After acknowledging God, adopt God's law between us. And after that, worship God so you adopt morality and decency. This is the proposition that you and I can find, you and I can discover, and you and I can maintain the purpose of life. Islam is a system with built-in answers. Islam is a system that has solutions to human problems. Islam is a system that addresses the misery of mankind, the degradation of mankind, the debasement of mankind, the problems and the tragedies of mankind. Because if a system of life cannot address those problems, it is not suited to be called a universal system. Islam is a system that reconciles the relationship between man and God, between man and woman, and between man and man, human beings. Islam is a system that sets down contracts of behavior, whether in marriage, whether in business, or in worship, and does not separate these things into compartments. It's all under the law of God and according to the behavior of his prophets.
Islam is able to fulfill all of this because unlike other religions, other systems, and other philosophical ideologies or isms, it has, Islam has, one, a comprehensive and unchanged scripture. The only system of life in the world that has a comprehensive and unchanged system since it was revealed and is memorized, was memorized in the time of the one whom it was revealed to, has been memorized by millions since that time. And the proof is that there are some sitting here that have memorized all 6,626 verses, like it was memorized before. It is the only scripture from God that has been retained as such. The proof of that is simple. If all the Christians of the world, all the churches, all the congregations, all the individuals agreed one day to take all of their books and throw them in the ocean, to take all the Bibles and throw them in the ocean, and all the Muslims said, we too will take all our books, the Qur'ans, and throw them in the ocean. The Christians would not be able to produce another Bible because they don't even agree today what is the Bible. The 354 different denominations, all of them claim 43 different Bibles, different books, different number of verses, even Old and New Testaments. And no one among the Christians, not one, not one in the world can claim that they have memorized the whole Bible because they haven't agreed what is the whole Bible. But there are millions of Muslims, maybe five or ten just in this room, who have memorized the entire Qur'an so that if we threw all the Qur'ans, they're just books with ink. Of course we respect it, but if we threw them all in the ocean, <coughs> we could bring ten Muslims from ten different countries that didn't know each other, and they could all stand here in this room right here and start from the beginning. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين and then they can go to the last surah أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل أعوذ برب الناس ملك الناس إله الناس من شر الوسواس الخنا الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس. The first and the last and the hundred and twelve surahs in between, and they would all agree, and then the Quran would come right back again. The second demonstration of the superiority of Islam and its system of life is that Islam has a human example. Now this is the most powerful thing because everybody wants a hero. And I don't mean, uh, I don't mean that, that, uh, that long piece of bread with some meat and cheese in it that they have in America. That's that, they call that a hero too. I mean, a hero means somebody that I look up to, somebody I want to be like, somebody I can imitate, somebody that inspires me, somebody that can guide me, somebody that I feel that my life could be like theirs. Everybody in the world wants a hero. But Almighty God already knows that about the human being. And so the, hu the Almighty God gave the human being over different periods of time, heroes, but he called them prophets and messengers. But those heroes, those prophets and messengers came to their own people. Then after Jesus Christ, because he said, I'm going to send you another hero. I'm going to send you a counselor. His name is the Admirable One. His name is the Chosen. His name is the Praiseworthy. His name is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
And Jesus said in that upper room, he told his companions, don't be afraid. I got to go. I have to leave. So be it. After I leave, the comforter, the counselor, that admirable one, he will come. For if I don't leave, he cannot come. That's what Jesus told them. You will know him because when he comes, he will not speak of himself. But whatsoever he hears from God, that shall he speak. What does that mean? He will not come with his own words. He will not come with his own poetry, with his own ego, with his own ideas, with his own opinions. He will not come like that. But whatsoever he hears from God, that's what he will come with. Hear from God means what? What God reveals to him. By what? Inspiration. Revelation. Second thing Jesus said, your hearts and your minds are not prepared for all the questions you have. So be it. When that counselor comes, he will relate all things to you in detail. That's the second thing he said about him. The third thing he said, you will know him because when he comes, he will speak of me. That's what he said. And the fourth thing he said, that which he hears from God will remain with you forever. Those are the four conditions. Now the Holy Ghost or the angel Gabriel didn't fulfill those conditions. And certainly Jesus Christ did not come back and fulfill those conditions himself. So the question here is, who, what came after Jesus Christ that fulfills that prophecy? Only one man. First of all, let me tell you that this book has in it a chapter called Mary. Now, who is Mary? Who is Mary? The mother of Jesus. So if a book that Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, claims that he heard from God, he didn't say, this is from me. I'm bringing you guys a book that I wrote, that I published, that I want you to read. No, he said, I heard a revelation from God. The angel Gabriel that visited all the other prophets brought me this revelation. So the characterization of this book is what he said, what he heard from God. Did Jesus say that? The second thing is, he said, your hearts and your minds are not prepared. But when he comes, he will explain all things in detail. The Quran says, Verily, this is a book that explains all things in detail. That's the second thing. Then he also said, he will mention me. The Quran has in it a chapter which is called, the surah called Maryam, the chapter called Maryam. And in the chapter Maryam, the birth of Mary, it mentions first the mother of Mary. What's her name? Hannah. It mentions how Hannah prayed to God for a son and that God gave her a girl. And when she asked God, oh God, you gave me a child that I prayed for, but it's a girl. I cannot give her to the priest of the temple for her to become a priest. God said, so be it. She will be one of the chiefs of the women in the hereafter. Who is that woman? Mary. But God gave the Hannah, the boy she asked for, through her daughter. So God gave her a double gift. Gave her a daughter that will be the chiefs of the women in the hereafter and gave her the son that she was asking for through her daughter, which was who? Jesus Christ. And not only did God give her the son, through her daughter, but made her son Christ Jesus, the Messiah, who was born without a father, the word of God, and a spirit given to Mary from God. The Quran says that. 
So Jesus said, he will speak of me. Not only does the Quran speak of Hannah, not only does the Quran speak of Mary, not only does the Quran speak of the immaculate birth, the phenomenal birth, the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ, but the Quran also talks about his miracles. How he healed the lepers, how he caused the blind to see, how he caused the deaf to hear, how he caused the, those who couldn't speak to speak, how he caused the dead to be risen from the grave, how he fed the masses of 10,000 or more people from what? Seven loaves of bread and fish, and how he blew his breath into a clay pigeon and caused it to fly. How Jesus Christ did these miracles, God says, he did it by the power of whom? Himself or whom? By God. The Quran. Does it confirm Jesus Christ? And fourthly, he said it will remain with you forever. For it to remain with you forever, it has to be intact from the time it was revealed. It's the only book that was intact from the time that it was revealed. So the natural progression of the life of Jesus, the natural progression of the love of Jesus and his message, the natural progression of the gospel of Jesus, the natural progression of the life of all the prophets and the system given by all those prophets, the natural progression of that is the Quran. The natural progression is Islam. And that human example is the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Let me leave you with this. Just tie yourself down a little bit. Settle the good in your seats. I'm going to ask you a question. The Quran says, certainly there is for you, human beings and believers, in the messenger of God, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most profound pattern of human behavior. Now that's a challenge that God has made to the world. Now this challenge must mean that it should be able to be proven that Muhammad, categorically, is the most profound human being that has impacted upon humanity. That's what it means. Now let's see if we can prove that. First of all, let me see if out of these 1,000 or more people that's in this room, of these intelligent, educated, sophisticated, knowledgeable, endowed, mature human beings, is there anyone here that has heard of anyone that they'd like to stand up and say that they believe is the most profound human being that has impacted upon humanity categorically? Now, we already talked about the prophets, so it had to be probably one of them. Surely couldn't have been Winston Churchill. Couldn't have been Bonaparte Napoleon. It can't be Michael Jackson. It can't be Michael Jordan. It can't be Michael Tyson. Who could it be? It's not your father. It's not your grandfather. It's not the president or the premier of this country. It's not George Bush. It's not Tony Blair. Who is it? Who's the most profound human being that has impacted on humanity in documented history? Who is it? Well, I'll give you a hint. Five biographers of this age. Five graduate, premier biographers of our age. All of them non-Muslims did a study to determine the hundred most profound human beings that have impacted upon history. Three of them conclusively said that it is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And one of them, whose name was Michael H. Hart. Now you can go check this out for yourselves. Michael H. Hart, he said that his choice would have naturally been Jesus Christ because he's a Christian. But he had to admit that Jesus Christ was not a father. He was not a husband. He was not a ruler. And he was not a statesman. So just on those issues, he said that he had to acquiesce.
to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, because the competition in that case was only between Jesus and Muhammad. So if Michael H. Hart, who would have chose Jesus, admitted that categorically, we're not saying that Muhammad is better than Jesus, we said categorically more profound impact because Muhammad was a father, he was a husband, he was a statesman, and he was a ruler, and Jesus Christ was not those four. My brothers and sisters, my respected non-Muslim guests, my proposal, my proposition to you is that our purpose of life here is that, one, we need to acknowledge Almighty God. Number two, we need to conform to Almighty God's law. Number three, we need to follow and admit the prophets of Almighty God and adopt their lives and their ways. And we need to begin as human beings to worship, introduce worship in our lives, a worship that is accepted by God. And whose worship is accepted by God? The worship of his prophets. Our purpose in life is to acknowledge God, conform to God, and worship Almighty God. I appeal towards you. I suggest to you, I propose to you, that all of you who are non-Muslims, whatever denomination that you are, whatever kind of human being that you are, that you acknowledge now, that you acknowledge in your hearts, in your seats, where you are, that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God. Can you do that? Can you do that? Those of you who can do that without any hesitancy, just like a blink, just like a knee jerk, just like if I said your name and I announced that I had a thousand dollars here for you, if I called you up and said, come on down, That's right. If I told you to come down and you were up there, you might fall off that balcony. <laughs> it would just be automatic. So I'm asking you a simple question. Can you admit? Can you declare? Can you at least raise your hand that there's none to be worshipped except the Almighty? Can you raise your hand? No, Muslims, put your hands down. <laughs> now I'm asking the non-Muslims here. That's the proposition I'm making. Can the non-Muslims that are sitting here that I can see, can you raise your hand and tell me how many of you can accept that there's none to be worshipped except God? How many? Count them out for me. I can't see with this light in front of me. Can you raise your hand for me, please? Don't just do like this. Raise it up there. Let me count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Is anybody? 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Now let me say this to you. To say that there's none to be worshipped except the Almighty God, that itself is to be Muslim. Now I didn't say that makes you an Arab. I didn't say that makes you an Arab. Because all Arabs are not Muslims, and all Muslims are not Arabs. As a matter of fact, only 19% of the Muslim population in the world are Arabs. To be a Muslim is just to acknowledge, first of all, that there's none to be worshipped except the Almighty God. And to be a little bit more definite, it means to accept that Muhammad is the messenger of God. That Muhammad is a messenger. If you can't say the final messenger of God, that's because you just don't know. But if Jesus, if Jesus prophesied Muhammad and Muhammad confirmed Jesus Christ and their morals were the same and they were brothers of the same prophecy, then Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, he had to be what he claimed to be and that is a messenger of God. Now among those who raised their hands, is there anybody here who can also accept that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Can I see the hand, please? One. Can you stand for me quickly? Just stand for me. Come right here, please. Thank you.
I want to make this uh, I want to make this transition or this transaction because this is what it is these are human beings that's making a transaction with God they're not making a transaction for us they're making a transaction with God and a transition in their lives so I want to make this easy for them we have a gift for them and we're going to give them this gift which includes give each one of them I'm going to tell them what it is Let me have one of the packages, I think, so I can tell them what it is. Now, the gift that we're giving to them is something that will help them on their way. One, it's a copy of the Quran with the transliteration of the meanings. Secondly, it's a short, easy to read, authentic biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Thirdly, it is a set of seven books. It is a set of seven books that have in it lessons for new Muslims. Now, your acceptance of Islam is your acceptance of God, not your acceptance of me, or not your acceptance of these people, nor your acceptance of the political dynamics in the world, because it has nothing to do with that. It's just your acceptance of God. And this gift is to help you make that trans transition. Did everybody receive a copy? You have a copy? Wonderful. I want you to say with me the simple words. And these words are nothing more than what I have explained. There's no trick, no curve, and we don't have a pool in the back for you to dip in. <laughs> Who? She's right here. No, she's here. My brother, who my brother who is, um, and rightfully so, is very concerned and very inspired about one of the ladies who are here, and I also, because she was brought here last night by her son, and I mean that's profound. That's the most profound gift that a son can give to his mother, and that's certainly the most profound gift that a mother can give to her son. And that's our sister Pam that's here. And I'll meet with all of these... Um, I'll meet with all of these um, fortunate and, um, and special people after we finish our meeting here this evening. But let's say the words. Let's just go over the words called the Shahada, the bearing of witness. And I'll tell you what it is. Essentially, it is the saying of that there is none to be worshipped except Almighty God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Saying that word and then adding to it, I testify or I declare or I announce that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God and that I testify or I declare or I announce that Muhammad is the messenger of a God brings you or into the transition of Islam. From that point, it's your sincerity. It's your acts of worship. It is your commitment that will make the difference. Now, whatever you owe God of something you did 
that only you know and God knows after tonight your board is clear. Because God is the forgiver of those that come back to him. But whatever you owe somebody, money, rent, a loan, you still owe that. <laughs> is that fair? Okay, please, just say after me the words, la, la, ilaha, illallah, Muhammad, Rasulullah, ashhadu, an la, ilaha, illallah. وأشهد أن محمدا عبده عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم آمين Now what I want to say to, uh, to you, brothers and sisters, and honestly, um, I am truly grateful in the sight of Allah, uh, not because I'm going to get paid for each one of you, <laughs> because it's not about that, uh, but I'm grateful because when, I'm look, when I look at you, I see myself 37 years ago. And I do realize, I do realize that sincerity and commitment and straight talking can change a person's life, because it certainly changed mine. And what I want to tell you is that all of you are fortunate because certainly someone brought you here tonight. I mean, your own inquisitiveness your own concern about life sort of navigated you here or brought you here. But someone, some Muslim who you have as an associate or a relative brought you here. That person is your sponsor. That sponsor should help you work out your problems and your transition. Now, because I live in the UK or because I'm from America, it means that I'll be a long distance mentor friend of yours, brother in Islam, and open for your, to help you resolve your problems. But the Muslims of Sydney, Australia, and in particular, the sponsor that brought you here, your relative or your friend, those are the people that should work things out for you. Yes. That's right. She said, it doesn't even have to be a person that you know because God might have brought you here. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. Now, unfortunately, tomorrow morning, I'll be going to Melbourne and coming back on Thursday. And what I would like to do is to arrange to have dinner with all of you when we get back. Can we arrange that? Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So please, take your gifts. Uh, I can't shake hands with you pretty ladies. God bless you so much. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, normally, normally when we um, end our lecture, we usually have some questions and answers, but I really think to myself that everything has really been served. Now, if there are some non-Muslims who are sitting here who were not prepared, who were not prepared now to step forward, to um, make that commitment, or to make that decision, that's okay because there's no pressure involved. And if you have some questions that you would like to ask me privately, uh, I'll be available for about 20 minutes after this lecture and the brothers can uh, bring you to that designated place and I'll be more than glad to sit with you. 
Uh, for those of you uh, who are not prepared to even do that, that's fine. I want to thank you. I want to thank you immensely just for coming out from your house and for sitting here just to find out what was our perspective of the purpose of life. Um, and I would like to say that I think now that minimally, uh, if somebody says to you something erroneous about Islam or our perspective of life, at least I think what you should do is set the record straight. That we are decent people. That we are God-loving people. That we are people who want to be good, law-abiding citizens and productive and progressive and that we just simply want to invite people to or we like to hear have our proposition to the world considered that's all and I think that we should have that right along with anybody else that has a system of life or religion would you agree and that if anything we want to compliment Sydney Australia or Australia or the UK or any other place in the world where Muslims reside right reside that's what we want to do I want to thank you very much